okay, because I have a bath. I have it set up when she goes in the bath. I get the clothing. And when I come in, if she's sitting out Trisha, do you wanna start? Well, I, just, I won't uh, take up any any more time. I just wanna thank uh, those of you that were able to make it this afternoon to take a look at it. Another uh, choice in the uh, process, so I'll, I'll uh, turn it over. Do you have any other comments, Mike? Or we yeah, I just want to thank everybody for the patience. Sorry that it, uh, you know, we're a little bit late today. Uh, they were in uh, Lycoming County up in Williamsport today, so obviously travel. Uh, and uh, so obviously this is clear ballot. So those that have the feedback would, would mind filling that out for me. That'd be great. And I will let Bill Mer Mer Murphy. Murphy. <laughs> uh, Murphy. 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 Yeah. yeah, Murphy. <laughs> but I almost said it, but, and I, you know, that's one of my weaknesses. I apologize. No, no worries. No worries. And then we've got, in case anybody forgets, we've got all the attendees here from Clear Valley. I want to thank you all for your patience, and I apologize for running late. We, uh, we're just getting to know the, you know, the traffic patterns here in Pennsylvania, but, uh, <laughs> but I thought we made pretty good time. Um, we're clear ballot. What we're going to show you today is is our system, and what you're seeing is the first uh, brand new voting system that's been put through federal certification in probably the last 30 years. So we got into uh, elections uh, by way of audits. About we should, we we our founders developed an, uh, a, a product that audited other voting systems. Uh, which to this day we're the only company that I am aware of in, in, on the planet that can read any voting system's ballots and provide an independent tabulation for comparison purposes. And we still do this in a number of states around the country. Uh, we were certified by the EAC last in, in uh, February of this year, and we're now working as a voting system in uh, four, four states. Um, Pennsylvania, we are in the process of going through state certification, uh, you know, to, to be a available voting system here in, in Pennsylvania. So, what we want to do today is just kind of give you a high-level overview of what we do, uh, how we do it. I, I, if you guys, and I assume everybody here has seen some of the uh, other voting systems that they've been through. You're number four. We're number four. Good. That's what we hope you'll see is a different approach. Um, the founders of our company came from outside of the elections industry, so what I think you'll see is a fresh perspective on tabulation and a lot more transparency and auditability in what, uh, you know, what we provide as an end result for the election, right? So with that said, uh, we've got a little video of some of our clients uh, talking about our system. I'm going to beg for forgiveness while I turn my volume on here. <laughs> what is the actual name of your voting system? You say you're clear ballot. What is yeah. the name of the, the name of the voting system? Is clear vote. Clear vote. And we, we you know, I, admittedly, we are not a marketing company. <laughs> uh, we have clear vote, which is made up of four components: clear design, clear access, which is this our accessible voting system, clear cast, which is our precinct scanner. And then clear count, which is our tabulation system. So that should all be very clear to you <laughs> by the end of this presentation. So I got design, <laughs> cast, and count. What was the other one? Access, uh, access count, and cast. And I've got uh, we've got uh, handouts here that that helps you make sure yeah. that the three commissioners have yeah. it. And then uh, what I can do, give me one, and then anybody if we don't have enough. Yeah, we've got extras copies. here if anybody wants to grab one. But this that that's a little bit more kind of high level. You know, details on the products, how we're different, a little bit about the company. Yeah, so here's that video I was talking about. I can make copies of this. 
in every phase. that were cast and then with a very little effort be able to pull up that exact race on the ballot and the entire ballot card if necessary. And each time you click it peels the onion that much more and allowing you to see the basis by which we decided or concluded that that number is the way it is. We can do not just a, a sampling, we can in fact verify that every image, every ballot is counted properly. It ends all questions. It gives finality to the election process, and it gives us a visual aid that we've never had before. Clear ballot, to me, has been the greatest advancement in the election process within the last 100 years. Seeing is believing. So, as you may have gathered from that video, we are a 100% paper voting system. We believe that is a key element to this, the security and auditability of any voting system. So every voter that comes in is going to get an identical paper ballot, whether they vote through our accessible voting system or if they're given a paper ballot to mark. And then those ballots you know, are, are just scanned through the, the precinct tabulator in each precinct. But then what our system does, uh, and Everything you see here is a commercial off-the-shelf component with the exception of this metal encasement around our, our tabulator. Uh, all the inside components are, are generally available. Um, so it makes it easy, it, it, makes, it makes you less beholden on us as a vendor. Um, but we believe that that gives you know, our clients the greatest amount of control, the greatest amount of, of uh, cost of, uh, efficiencies and uh, and uh, the planned obsolescence of the system is, is removed from, from the element. So uh, while I'm doing some of this, I wanted to introduce two people that are here with me. Ingrid Giordano is our regional sales manager for Pennsylvania, and Keir Holman is our uh, sales engineer for the company. So um, Ingrid, do you want to talk a little bit about certification? Sure. At the, at the stage? So as Bill, as Bill mentioned, we are um, federally, or what is called the EAC, Election Assistance Commission, certified. And that happened for clear ballot in February of this year. So uh, we, we are federally certified. And in talking to the division, or the, the, the Department of State here in, in Pennsylvania, what they told us is that there was a very specific um, single action crossover rule that's unique to Pennsylvania and nobody else and so we have developed that into our system and shared it with the with the department and they've approved that it does do what it's what it's supposed to do for Pennsylvania so we are on since we, we are federally certified we are on now on a six-month schedule of updating that federal certification we'll be submitting uh, the, the change for Pennsylvania to the federal test labs in August and with that report and conclusion of, of a new version of certification, we will share that information concurrently with the, with the Department of State. And they will do the testing that they need to do immediately following the test report from the federal government. So we're thinking that we will probably be uh, through certification at the end of the year. When I talked to Jonathan Marks, who's the head of the Department um, of Elections, what he shared with me is that it's a priority for them to have all the voting systems certified by the end of the year to give everybody a maximum amount of choice in, in which technology best suits their county. Um, so that is our plan. Uh, like I said, we've already completed our development and we're preparing our, 
our submission to the federal test lab, and then we'll go through the Pennsylvania certification shortly thereafter. You all are probably aware uh, Pennsylvania has an excellent team at the elections department, and they are well prepared to work with the federal test labs to get an expedited certification process for all the vendors, not just clear ballot, but, but everyone at the same time. So. Um, we are bringing in the, the paper-based system that you'll see here today. It's the, the precinct-based uh, tabletop scanner, uh, the ballot marking device uh, for, for a lot of counties in Pennsylvania that are used to fully electronic voting system. So that is a little bit of a departure. The ballot marking device allows for an accessible marking session and audio session. We also have uh, you know, tactile uh, audio uh, assistance devices that go with the system uh, but all of the ballots in, within a precinct would go through our uh, our, our tabulator our, ca our uh, digital tabulator there that you see on the tabletop there so you have one point of uh, tabulation within the polling location and then we do offer probably our, our uh, one of our first uh, products that we've been uh, deploying in the West Coast in Oregon and Washington, along with New York and Florida, is our tabulation system that is a central base system. And that will also be a part of our certified solution in, in Pennsylvania to do the absentee. And for any counties that choose to collect ballots and, and tabulate them centrally, we'll be, we'll be offering that as well. Awesome. So, <clears throat> so you guys saw us set up the precinct system. This is what you know what we kind of propose as your normal precinct setup it has you know one uh, accessible voting unit and one precinct tabulator a few things that are unique about our precinct tabulator i mentioned that it's all commercial off the shelf components uh, you know everything within this is you know generally available stuff easily replaceable uh, the up there's i think there's only five components a, a, a power source a scanner uh, a processing unit, a touch screen, you know, for the voters, and, uh, and then and a the USB, yeah, and the printer, printer. yeah. So very minimal parts. Um, we have a collapsible <coughs> ballot bag that attaches to the back of this. One of the things that's unique about our voting system is nothing is done mechanically in the tabulation of the votes. Everything that we do, whether it's centrally or through this precinct unit, is to collect the ballot image and we we capture the highest quality ballot image of any voting system that's out there we use 200 dpi grayscale which is the same level that most court documents are required to be stored in uh, what that allows us to do is is maintain a digital record of the image and still maintain the, the physical ballot for auditability um, once, because we're able to do that, we don't separate anything. If there's a write-in vote or anything like that, it just falls in the bag and everything's done digitally. So you don't have to go back and, and kind of sift through individual ballots and count them by hand or remake them or anything like that. Um, to, to put it into perspective, uh, Pierce County, Washington uh, was our first client, voting system client in, Wa in the state of Washington. And they had to, they're, they're a vote by mail state. They had to remake 56,000 ballots because of, you know, issues with voter intent or, you know, some, for some reason it would not tabulate, so it had to be remade onto another ballot. Uh, I think they worked that out to about, it cost them about $10 per ballot to remake it because they had to have a team of two to establish what it needed to go in there. We cut that down from 56,000 to 17 ballots in their first election using us. So there is a, you know, a hard dollar return on investment that comes with our system that some of these other systems just don't, uh, don't offer. Any questions so far? Yes, ma'am. Um, you're saying you do paper ballot only. What about for someone who is blind yep. or so that's what we have the accessible uh, system for. So this, I just closed that session. Up. So 
This is uh, built on a product called the Anywhere Ballot. And the Anywhere Ballot was an EAC funded uh, program to basically design a user interface that would allow any voter to vote from any platform, uh, regardless of disability, cognitive or physical, uh, and regardless of where they were, if, if they wanted to do it on a phone or over the internet, whatever. We use a browser interface, which is not connected to the internet in any way, but it runs in kiosk mode on this machine, and it allows us to leverage that interface, that user interface. So I'm going to go, let me choose a 17 year old. Excuse me? One of the 17. Okay. Are you needing me up there? 17, 17. Yeah. So I just selected the ballot style for this particular voter. So your your, your poll workers would select the ballot style for the for the uh, the voter. And if you are you guys using electronic poll books? No. Okay. If you ever if you were ever to move to that and you had a barcode or some media that was created by that, you could use that to scan in and, and select the, the ballot style from there. But here we just did it manually. Um, We've got uh, multiple languages. Uh, it can be read in multiple languages, both audibly and on the screen. But we're going to select English here. We've got settings, right? So you can hear the sound. All this sound is, is machine generated from our design tool. And that's automatic. It, it doesn't require any work from the county. Um, you can change colors. You can turn the sound off. You guys have all heard the sound demonstrated. Uh, but that is of particular interest for voters with visual impairments. Um, so some, you know, uh, you can also leave the sound on. We have headphones that can plug into the unit. Uh, we can turn the screen off if the voter chooses to not have the screen up when they're voting. Uh, and then they can just listen. We have uh, easy, uh, what are they called? The it's an audio tactile device yes. um, that allows the voter to navigate through the ballot by listening forward to the, you know, mm -hmm. forward arrow to the next mm -hmm. contest. Is that next like a handheld that plugs it is. in? Yeah. It, okay. is. it is a USB uh, plug in to, to the tablet here. Um, other things that we can do, uh, because it is a universal plug-in, is we can accommodate a voter's technology. If a voter comes in with a very specific joystick that they use on their wheelchair, for example, um, a sip and puff mouse, uh, most voters don't want to use a provided technology for sanitary reasons. I think I can understand that too. And they want to use their own, and it can plug in with this universal port as well. Uh, the, the rocker paddles, all kinds of different, um, all kinds of different navigation devices can be plugged into this and, and used. Yes, ma'am. If, if they get plugged into one, you know, they plug into that mm -hmm. ADA uh, part. Mm -hmm. How long will it take for that? For them to be at that machine well realize and i think this is true to absolutely right. any accessible voting mm -hmm. experience right and this has been true for many years now um that listening to those instructions and listening to the full ballot depends on the size of the ballot of course but i have in various parts of the country seen that take you know anywhere from 10 minutes prefer a pretty short ballot uh to maybe 30 minutes for an exceptionally long ballot right. so that's it's it's just the length of time that takes. Now you do have the that voter has the ability to speed up the okay. uh, this, yeah. the um, the voice of the of the system, and so if if they are used to listening, which which most uh, visually impaired voters are, they're used to listening at a higher rate of speed and absorbing that content, then they can speed up that language and they can turn up the sound and turn it down. All of the things that that you would expect um, in that accessible experience. And one of the things that Bill talked about with the um, Anywhere ballot, that was really, uh, was the purpose of that project was to identify what is the most usable, best practice ballot experience for everyone, regardless of ability and, and regardless of disability. What, is the, what covers the most amount of people? And that's why you, we have contrast uh, you know, from white to black to black to white, or taking out yellow or adding yellow, having all of those different variations there for color blindness, uh, the speed, of course, the the the, um, the volume. So there's lots of different options, and that seems like that would be 
um, when you're thinking about all these options, it seems like a lot on the front end. But what, what we have found is that working with voters who have a particular assistive need, that they like to learn about the voting system ahead of time. They like to come prepared and maybe spend a little bit of extra time learning about it prior to election day when they arrive and they have a sense of, of what's going to work best for them. Do you all have quite a number of, of assistive uh, experienced voters? No? no? We obviously have it available at every precinct. Sure, because you have to, right? right? Yeah, but I, do you have a lot? I mean, I, no. I have not no. heard yeah. that a lot of people use it. But every once in a while, you'll get one person. Yeah. Every once in a while. And it doesn't have to be somebody with an, a, 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 an assistive need. Right. It could be really anybody um, that, that wants to use it for that experience, right? Um, but again, I, I find any transition like this, especially when you're, you're doing a, a particular amount of outreach for voters with, with assistive needs, that it's great to have a demo unit in your office and, and go to different opportunities where you can uh, educate those folks about how, how the, what they'll be experiencing in the polling location, and it really really makes a big difference for yeah, them. Actually, Pennsylvania law requires us to have it out. Oh, okay. so, great. So, right. some days before the election, which we do out in the hall, which sure. through, so. I think that's universal to everyone. I think that's good. So, there's, there's a lot of different features to it, and that it's based on trying to cover the most amount of folks. Um, and then the, uh, you know, the, the touch screen works pretty simply. Um, <coughs> It's got a next button here that you, you see when I change, it'll say, I can skip this if I want to. Um, this is a vote for two, so it's gonna ask me to vote for two. If I try to vote for three, it will warn me that I've overvoted. Uh, so it won't let me do that. And then once the, the ballot has been voted, it just says, it asks to print. You print that and then it's coming off there. And it prints, you know, because we, we're born as a audit system. We're a lot more tolerant. Uh, you know, our system's a lot more tolerant of skew, and so we're able to to print off these low-cost uh, Oki printers, uh, where in a lot of places we need specialized paper, specialized ballots, um, and it can get quite expensive. So uh, this and duplex is up to a 19-inch ballot. Can, can this then be used as just a ballot marking device? Um, yep. In addition to being meeting your ADA requirement, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh. Oh. Does work? No, it's a different election. Remember? Uh, <laughs> I thought that's what you told me. It's like seventeen. No, I'm sorry. Oh, so if you have something that someone tries to put in there, let's say they somehow got a hold of a ballot from last year and yes. they try to reuse it, it's going so to that. So that was a non-official. So you did that on purpose. Good job. <laughs> Just demonstrating <laughs> a, a feature. Okay. So it, it's it's hard coded to know exactly what it should be expecting. Right. Absolutely. And can you do that down to the precinct level? Yes. Okay. So. So if someone somehow gets a ballot, would hopefully not, but from one precinct and then tries to come and use it at a different precinct and then feeds it through that, it would be bad because it's not the right precinct. 100%. I could not have explained that more effectively myself. Okay. But I will try because I have a <laughs> diagram that I made so just for that purpose just, that I skipped over a little bit. So this is the architecture of our system. Clear design is where all the ballot definitions are created. And that's you know what Michael was just talking about. So we define out the ballots, we build the ballots, in clear design, that creates an, an accessible definition file and a ballot definition file that is used to program both the access and the cast machines. So that would be done, you know, well in advance of the, uh, the election. <laughs> Once they're programmed, uh, then they're ready to go out. You know, they're, they're tested in here, and then they're ready to go out to the precincts. This this entire setup can fit in the trunk of a car. The uh, precinct machine weighs about 30 pounds. Um, the ballot bag, as I mentioned, folds flat and uh, uh, can hold about 13, about 1,000 to 1,300 ballots, depending on you know, your paper stock. Um, we're very flexible on the, you know, the types of stock. We don't require any uh, proprietary paper, um, which a lot of, a lot of uh, voting systems do. Um, as long as you know, it's been tested and certified by us, we're good. Um, your ballot's the most scan ballot right there. If I may, if we can back up also to the your question about programming the devices. So from clear design, we have a ballot definition file that informs the CAS unit what to expect. Here are all the possible ballot styles within the county. 
And the same thing happens with the clear access machine or the clear access unit. A file says here are all the, the various ballot styles for this upcoming election. During the testing uh, and you know preparation to get these you know tested and then packed up and sent out to the polling location, that is when you inform the each individual unit. You now belong to Precinct 101, and you will only accommodate the ballot for Precinct 101 or the collection of ballots. Uh, same thing for the access unit, so that it, it you don't have to have every single ballot readable or available on those machines when they go out to the precinct. So to protect against the very thing that you described, preventing the wrong ballot style from being introduced into that, into that precinct. So this is a ballot style that we can recognize on here. Uh, one of the things I think you'll notice is it's pretty quick to you know, accept the ballot. One of the things that's different about our system is with every ballot that is counted through that system, we create you know, a ballot image of both sides of the ballot that's retained on the, the media that would come back to the central office. So um, there is no, because we're built on a modern technology platform and, and you know, the foundation of it is, is built on new, new code, you know, for lack of a better term, uh, there's no degradation in the speed of this machine even when you get up to a thousand votes on it. You know, a lot of a lot of systems, older systems, will slow down as their memory begins to fill up. Um, and with our system, that, that doesn't uh, come into play. Yes, ma'am. So you only have one of those in a precinct. Yes, ma'am. But how do you get there? I mean, um... so so the depending on how the the precinct is is set up, if you if you preprint the ballots. Uh, you would have those pre-printed ballots, your voter would come in, they would identify themselves, be handed a ballot style, a paper ballot of their, you know, of their style, uh, and then they would mark that in a voting booth, or just a, a standalone voting booth or a table, uh, whatever you know, is mo most efficient. Uh, and then once they're done, they would scan it through. And it doesn't take but three seconds to get that ballot tabulated. If uh, you didn't want to pre-print the ballots, we have a uh, ballot on demand system which could generate the ballot style once the uh, the voter came there so that would el eliminate the need to pre-print a, a tremendous amount of ballots. Do they all print as slow as that? Uh, I don't know. If, well this the reason this prints a little bit slower is it, it, it typically has to warm up. Uh, printers pull a lot of energy when they're printing so the more often it's used the, the faster it prints. I don't know the answer. It's about 80. Find out. 80. It's about 80. That's what I've okay. seen on the spectrum. Okay. Yeah. So if you did ballot on demand, that's how you would generate. Yes, sir. And is it thermal paper, or do you have to be putting ink in that thing? It does require toner. Yeah. It's a it's a small laser jet, so it doesn't require like an ink jet, which is you know goes through ink far more quickly. Um, it is not thermal. Uh, the cost of the paper is lower and not proprietary. Um, but yes, each each um, printer would need to have the toner checked. Um, we know what as part of the Do hmm? we know what the capacity of, of like a toner cartridge? Yeah, it's is. usually about four four thousand to six thousand pages. Uh, is that one sided or that would be one sided. They're rated for one sided, um, so it would be cut that in half for a duplex ballot. So you're saying that if you had a ballot on demand, 4,000 to 6,000 single-sided, mm -hmm. half if it was duplexed, right. or you could pre-print them. Right. And or you most, could do a, maybe a, if you had a or hybrid. you could do something with hybrid. Yep. Um, okay. If you have, or if you ever had any um, uh, vote centers or uh, early voting where you, anybody in the county could come and, and cast their ballot, then ballot on demand makes a whole lot of sense because then you don't have stacks and stacks of every ballot style. Um, in a precinct with only one or two ballot styles or in the case of a primary, you know, you'd have uh, the various party ballots, 
then pre-printed ballots make more sense um, because you don't have to deploy that many of them. Uh, and it makes it easier for the poll workers as well. Right. well my guess would be ballot in the man, you probably would have, if you have it, you would have it at like the election office. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you could, you would have pre-printed so many ballots and then if you run short or close to short, then you print them. Yeah. And then when you you're down to 150 out. ballots, yeah. you know, run another 500. So that's a lot of extra work for you. Well, it would be, yeah, I mean, it, but it would be nice about it is you could you could possibly eliminate the number of pre-printed ballots you would have to print because you would be able to eliminate waste because you could have a, a smaller number. Um, so you, you know, you're, you have to use that accounting degree I have, but you know what I'm saying? You would have to work on how many you want to print, try to figure that out, but if you did run short, you would have the ability to print more without being like, oh no, what am I gonna do because I didn't print enough ballots, but you wouldn't, like you know how the Pennsylvania law is 110%? Mm -hmm. If you had a way to do ballot on demand and you could get it out to the, to the precinct, you could do less than 110%. So it'd be a way to kind of kind save, of that. There's, there's kind of a way you could save money. That's why I was kind of, when I was saying about hybrid, I, pro I wouldn't have it at, at a polling location, but as a central location, possibly, yes. Or maybe, or a few, maybe. Yeah, most yeah, of the right. people that have the in-precinct ballot on demand are, are places that have vote centers where they don't, you know, they need to have every ballot style available uh, and they don't want to pre-print all those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, we, but our ballot on demand system does have the ability to generate like mass produced ballots in your central office or do, you know, a one-to-one -one thing, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Are you at all concerned about people reaching in that bag back there and pulling this, out some of the votes? Yeah, this is sealed, you know, during the election. Uh, it zips closed, it, it, uh, it has security seals on the back of the machine that connect the ballot bag to the machine and that close these two loops here. So that would be closed at the beginning of the election day and would not be reopened. And, and I'm sorry, you did say it does seal to the back of the machine? Yep. Well. Yeah, there's a, I don't know. If and you're talking like a <coughs> seal, like a plastic seal that would, you would. You could use a numbered seal just like you do for your supply bags. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, oftentimes yeah. those those wired number seals mm -hmm. are, are excellent for this. They're inexpensive. Um, inspectors are, are accustomed to them. And it does uh, prevent any penetration of the ballot box during the voting period. So how many did you say that can hold? About 1,000 to 1,300. I apologize for us bouncing around uh, a little bit, but we do have a video that talks a little bit about the clear pass machine. So. Clear pass, clear ballots, digital scan, tabletop precinct scanner. ClearCast is an EAC certified system that provides unparalleled transparency and confidence in the results of your election through ClearBound's groundbreaking vote visualization tabulation software. ClearCast leverages commercially available components for high performance and modern technology in a machine with the smallest footprint in the industry. Because ClearCast uses commercially available components, it is able to leverage a simply designed, inexpensive ballot box with a small footprint. Our ballot box attaches securely to the ClearCast machine with standard ties and has a capacity of 1,000 ballots. ClearCast includes a commercial grade scanner. Ballots scanned are captured by the system using a high performance white light scanner, which creates a ballot image in 200 DPI grayscale, the highest quality ballot image in the industry. Ballot images are stored in three redundant locations for security purposes. ClearCast is built on a modern technology platform, which means our precinct scanners maintain their speed no matter how many votes are cast. As the first software-driven precinct tabulator, it allows flexibility and customization. Alerts can be configured to match your jurisdiction's needs. ClearCast has been designed to make the most of your warehouse. Nine ClearCast machines make up the same footprint two of ClearBalance competitors, making transportation and storage easier and more cost effective. At the end of the day, when your election is done, our ballot box becomes your ballot and digital media transport case to carry the election artifacts back to your central tabulation location. ClearCast is the first precinct system that allows election officials to show the map behind their election results, which is needed now more than ever. ClearCast streamlines your election operations, providing you with the highest performing, most compact, modern technology in the industry. Election officials and voters 
can have the confidence that every vote was counted as cast. So that that's another uh, uh, point that that I, we found is important, and it was it was I think part of the initial design, but we didn't realize how uh, valuable it would be to the jurisdictions that we're working with. The the footprint for storage of this, um, you know, we have. Uh, like a baker's cart that we've outfitted with a bunch of uh, power strips and we can store nine of these machines uh, and program them on those carts uh, in, in the space it would take for, you know of two of our competitor systems so uh, if space is a concern this is a, a great way to free up a lot of uh, useful space in your warehouse um, I have a question for you. Do you currently have your inspectors deliver the equipment to the polling location? Do they come pick it up? or do they, you the, the judges. Judges. Judge of, election. It's okay. yeah. judge of election come to our office to pick up their election supplies, but mm -hmm. then, of course, we're DRE right now, so we, right. we then deliver the voting machines to the, to the actual precincts. Okay. Okay. Well, this is very much designed to, to let those judges also pick up the voting equipment. It'll be in a, a sealed um, carrying case with wheels on it. Um, you can seal, seal it with that same type of numbered seal, ensuring that it's not accessed and, and tampered with uh, leading up to the time that it arrives in the polling location. And, you know, it fits in everyone's car, um, as opposed to having a great big ballot box that typically you need a truck. So that was really part of the, the reason for the design of the smaller carrying case ballot box. Uh, as opposed to the, the great big ones. Are those collapsible? They it's are. Mm -hmm. Only reason why, because right now, like you're saying, 1,000 to 1,300 mm -hmm. ballots, we have some precincts that you know have a lot of registered voters at this sure. point. So in high volume elections, definitely would have to be more multiple boxes. Um, so two, two of the carrying cases come with each machine. Okay. So you could uh, absolutely uh, pause any voters from inserting their ballot into the scanner at a point where, and, and you may have seen the little window on the side, it's it's just yes. trans, translucent, not transparent, um, allows you to see if it's being, being filled up. And you can also train those judges to look at the, the public count that's on the screen at all times and say, you know, at about a thousand ballots, it'd be a good idea to just kind of uh, take a minute and attach the second empty ballot box and then seal up the, the counted ballots and um, you know, store those until they're returned on election night. Yes, ma'am. How much is uh, your machine? Um, we haven't submitted any pricing to the state, but uh, they run, uh, I, I believe in other states, they're roughly $5,000. That's the scan? For the scanner. Yeah, with scanner ballot box, uh, a year of maintenance, and, um, and a case. Comes with a, it comes with and a soft side of the soft side case, yeah. The the, the storage media, the, the Did I hear thumb drives. Three in the in the um, presentation you had there was it three different ways that it stores memory? I think yeah, there's uh, so we have two two uh, USBs okay. here, and then there's a hard drive, oh, an okay. internal hard drive where it stores as well. Yes, sir. Uh, going back to the ballot on demand concept. Hmm? Would it be conceivable to have, we have rovers. Yes. That go and, you know, they each have assigned precincts that they check on throughout the day, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever's needed. So if, if we were to do a hybrid type ballot uh, creation that, like Mike talked about, where let's say for round numbers, a precinct has a thousand registered voters, yep. we expect it to be a, 60% uh, turnout, so you, you know you print 600 or 700 of these, and suddenly something's you know something's happened. Everyone's Election coming becomes popular. So now you need. <laughs> so can a rover carry some sort of medium that they could then go produce ballots? For example, we have county-run uh, magisterial district judge offices mm -hmm. located around the county. So could a rover? You know, stop in at a nearby county-owned office with county-owned printers and so on, generate another hundred ballots from a USB stick, and then deliver them to the polling place. I'm just trying to. I mean, our county is not that 
yeah. expansive that it's impossible to come back here and get some, but I'm just thinking about on the run. Kind For of a thing. couple of reasons, you'd probably want to stick with the uh, the approved, I won't say certified because it's not part of the voting system per se, but the um, the ballot on demand printer, the kind of dedicated, if you will, okay. um, and it's going to be able to duplex the ballot, um, and you know all printers have different settings. I would be a little nervous about using a printer that you are you haven't tested before each election to make sure that somebody else hasn't used it, changed the settings on it. Okay. And then it's not going to accurately print your ballots. Right. But that it would, would be it, it would reject it if there's something wrong. With it. it would, but then but you, you don't would want printed those ballots. There, we yeah. ballots. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'd use a dedicated printer. Okay. Yeah, the, probably the better option for your rovers would be, you know, having the central office fielding calls from the precincts. Hey, we're low. We're going to generate these things. The rover comes, gets them, and delivers them. Gotcha. You know. Um, that way you're centralizing the, the, the creation of those and there's less points of failure. Mm -hmm. So, yes ma'am. I have um, down four hour battery life, is that accurate? Or yeah, is that yeah, four and a half the, on this machine. Uh, I think the federal standard is two. Um, is that built in or is that a separate? It is built in, yeah. it is built in and it is included. And if it is plugged in, it is charging. Yes, um, it'll run without the battery. And one of the things that, that I hope you take away from this conversation today is that, you know, using those off-the-shelf components that we've talked about, meaning commercial, commercially available, as time goes on, the idea is that battery technology will get better. Processors will get better. Scanners will get better. I mean, we've just seen that in technology in our own personal lives. Our phones, you know, change every couple of years now, right? Um, as that happens, we are on a path to upgrade the components in the system with new, better, commercially available components and break that cycle of obsolescence of the voting systems that have been in the, in the marketplace for decades now. They're very purpose-built, you know, sometimes, sometimes uh, various components are made just for that voting machine and nothing else. And so our methodology behind this design is we have a thermal printer in here that you know if a better printer comes out five years from now ten years from now it would be easily replaced in the voting system and it could be upgraded and then you get more life out of that investment that you put in now and that goes for the processor the printer you know all the media uh, the, the battery all those types of things yes ma'am um, you make it sound very simple mm -hmm. but something I heard from one of the other presenters was that every time you change something, you have to go through recertification. Is that true or not true? So we, it is true. It is true. But um, I guess my point is that in you know it, in our world where we are upgrading the system every six months, every year to improve it from a software standpoint, that we would also take that opportunity to um, to upgrade to a, a new component in the in the units themselves to give give our customers that flexibility well, rather than just saying we're no longer making this machine anymore you have to go buy it. That's unique because for instance the voting machines we have now are capable of accepting a paper ballot right. but it has never been approved and now they say they're obsolete and they're not going to do that. So right. it's unusual for me to hear that somebody's willing to go back and go through that process again and upgrade them. This it does make us different. Yeah, this is, the, this is the foundation of our company. You know, we were built, you know, because we saw the lack of innovation that has existed in elections for decades, right? I think people have used certification as a barrier to innovation. Um, and the way we saw our opportunity was, look, if we can come in here and deliver on innovation, deliver something that's different, uh, and commit to improving this, and we have, I think we've been through six the certifications in Oregon state certifications. Uh, we're working on our second federal certification that will be what we put through Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And we have a release that is going to be, you know, our third federal certification uh, plan for uh, 2021 um, or 2020 for use in 2021. So that's that's the plan. Yes, sir. Okay, back to, back to cost. 
even though I really don't care. Because um, I'm not paying it. <laughs> the free print, can you do it on 20 pound paper? And 20 is a little thin. Uh, I think our, our minimum is our, I think we've got a range between, what is it, between 60 and 80 or here? Our, uh, our best practice is starts around 60 pounds. Uh, when you start to get 40 pounds and above though, it really does a decent ballot. Um, best practice is between 60 and 100 pounds. We try to be as flexible as possible, but at some point... What's, what's the estimated becomes... cost, pre-printing versus the estimated cost of using printing on demand? So cost per ballot? Yeah, yeah. Like an general idea of a pre-printed per... ballot yeah. can cost anywhere from, I'm going to say, I've heard estimates as low as 8 to 10 cents, and as high, you know, in some places of the country where it's... Yeah. 25 cents, even 50 cents if it's a very big ballot. So it really does depend on the size of the ballot. And, and we are not a ballot printer, we're not yeah. a commercial printer. We allow our customers to work with local printers. I know that Pennsylvania, most of the jurisdictions work with uh, William Penn. Um, I don't know if you do, but you know we, we, do, we do give our customers that flexibility because all across the country, everybody wants to work with a local printer that can print things at the last minute, maybe be, um, sensitive to the economies of it and um, you know has has a long working relationship with her so you just with. give them some type of file with your requirements of what would work on your equipment I'm assuming and then that's what yep. we, get so we go through a we go through yeah. a short uh, uh, testing period we certify those printers we say you know these are our standards and um, this is how you print our ballots and they typically will run some ballots for us and then we test them for our customers to make sure that they meet those standards, and then we say, "Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good solution for you." Um, and you know, we've had cases where some some uh, counties want to use their own print shops. Um, we recommend that same process. So yep. We're not charging for it. We're just we're just doing that as a first courtesy. Yeah, customers. and again, and it goes back to you know giving you guys control over your own costs, right? So mm -hmm. you can use a printer if you find that that's the best you know approach. But if you want to cut some costs out of it and you've got the ability to print in house, you know, you have the ability to do that and we'll work with you or your printers, um, you know, to make sure that that, that works. Yes, ma'am. Um, the other thing I noticed that's unique about yours is uh, that appears to be a metal case. Everybody else is coming yes. with plastic. Yes. Like impact rating, if, if that's dropped, we, what are the chances of it breaking? If, Slim, <laughs> you know, the idea behind this was we wanted to build, you know, something that was uh, like a tank, only lighter, um, you know, but something that was going to be durable, was going to protect the components internally, um, and, uh, and maximize, you know, the useful life of the machine. So, um, your useful life is? Tell you when we get there. We've only, we only just got certified in February, so Same. I'd like to say 20 years, but you know, that's just my opinion. <laughs> With that plan that we talked about, I mean, I think 15 to 20 years is realistic. Um, being able to change out a processor to something new, change out printers as they became, become improved over time, that type of thing. Yeah, and we're I, we're a young company. You know, we're very nimble. You know, we don't have seven layers of management if we want to you know work out a licensing plan that says look after four years or five years we're gonna you know do a refresh of, of, of you know the hardware of the software or whatever you know we're actually discussing those type of programs internally right now uh, and we, we look forward to offering those um, you know to places that are that are interested in that kind of uh, scenario so you went in to business in 2009, you're 10 years old? Yes, ma'am. And how many places are you in now? We have uh, 13 jurisdictions using our voting system in Oregon. We have 10 in Washington, seven in Florida. Uh, six in New York. Six in New York. The state of Maryland. The state of Maryland, the uses, state of Vermont. uses our system for audit. Yeah. They audit. We audit 100% of ballots in Maryland with our technology. Um, and then we have uh, one jurisdiction in Wisconsin and one jurisdiction in Ohio uh, that are using this system. And you're new to PA, like just starting selling is my understanding, is that correct? Yes. 
Yes. And the same with Wisconsin and Ohio. We just started there too. Yeah. And since you guys are coming from a DRE, uh, you know, kind of background, I want to jump into our tabulation system because most folks that we work with, at least in Ohio, that are coming from a DRE, you know, the, the big fear is how are we going to handle paper, right? This is a new thing for you. And one of the things I think is most valuable about our system is all the things that people, that caused people to move to a DRE system in the past, I feel like we address through our software and we eliminate a lot of the, you know, the, the, the really specific pain points that, that you know, uh, a marked paper ballot by a human being caused, but we, we retain all the benefit uh, and the auditability of having a actual voter marked document that you can go back to. So with that. Bill, can I just interrupt? I'm sorry. Um, yes. Definitely want to see that. I do. Yeah. But we're kind of at the time where we would have normally had for our commissioner presentation. So I just wanted to make sure. I don't know if they have something they need to go to or have to do. So um, I just didn't have any other questions or anything. You absolutely need them to see. That this is seat. what they need. I don't to know see. how, yeah, how this long is, that is. So. This is our superpower. This is the one thing that we do that no one else does. If you have noticed the tablecloth, <laughs> it's what makes us different. So I wanted you guys to at least see that before you left. And we can do a, a brief start to it so they yeah. can kind of get the idea. And then if we go deeper later, that's fine. Yeah. If, that's up to them. I don't know what their time frame your is. Your call. Like, so we're good. Okay. Thank you. You want me to jump into it? Okay. So we're going to now jump into our live. This is actual product. Is that showing the dashboard? It, it is. is. Okay. Um, so first things first, you'll notice we're running in what looks like an internet browser. Uh, the reason is it's because it's Google Chrome, it's a browser. Uh, but just be aware we're not at all touching the internet. This is all local stuff. Uh, our software is built in a browser environment which gives you certain tools that you can take advantage of and I'll point some of those out as we go through. Uh, this is our dashboard for a demonstration election. I actually scanned these ballots at home last week in order to get ready for this. Um, there's a lot of different numbers here. Uh, we will uh, drill into some of them as we go along. Um, you have some tools available to you. Because we're in the browser environment, I can make things larger and smaller very easily. So if there's certain things that you want to do that for as you're using the software, you have that ability natively in the browser environment. So with that, I'm going to open up a statement of votes cast. And what this is is just essentially election totals, who won, who lost, etc. Uh, I want to look at the example of Washington here, our candidate under the governor's race. Notice that he won this race pretty handily, 48 to 22 in this particular case. But if we wanted to see how he won and actually see his votes, we could click on them. And you'll see that open up and you'll actually see his votes populate. Now we have built uh, the straight party environment here, so we actually tell you here that empty ovals are straight parties. So when you see these empty ovals down here that are votes for Washington, it's because he was included on a straight party uh, ticket. These votes are ranked from left to right, top to bottom in order of system confidence. So you'll notice the really well filled in ovals as I hover over this one here and the race box open, opens up. You see a dark oval filled in for George Washington there. Um, but if we come down here, this was still a vote we counted for George Washington, but it's the least confident in the list. So if somebody didn't really follow instructions, they actually just put a slash through the other, but we counted that too. So where some systems tally the votes and they say, hey, you know, we had 25 votes for candidate A and, and 20 votes for candidate B, you know, we, we assume accuracy, but they don't show you those votes. We will actually show you the votes. And yeah, a lot of things you see when you hover over, you'll notice that uh, we'll bring up the whole race box and show you everything within that contest. And to that end, if we uh, drop down just one level, we have the overvotes that Washington was involved in. So if I hover over this oval here, and I hope everybody can see this on the smaller screen. If you can't, feel free to come up and crowd me. But we have a, a vote for one race and somebody pretty clearly filled in both ovals. So that would be an overvote, and, and no vote would have been counted. But another example 
that we will show you is something like this. Maybe when somebody looks to have corrected a mistake they made on the ballot. We will show you those as well. And uh, pretending for a second that, uh, that you guys determined that this was a, a mistake that somebody tried to correct on their ballot, we can actually click on that oval and bring up the whole ballot. Notice the quality of the image, that's 200 DPI grayscale, it's the best image you'll see of any company that comes in here of, of a scanned paper ballot uh, that does meet federal records retention requirements. So if you notice on the left, here's kind of a summary of the races, and notice the colors. The uh, kind of the lavender or purple indicates an undervote, or a blank voted undervote. So nobody voted the uh, straight party ticket here on this on this ballot. The red indicates your overvote, the whole reason we came to this ballot, and the green are actual good votes for candidates and other races. So we actually give you the ability to adjudicate this ballot digitally. So we can modify this adjudication, go here and call this a votable ballot, and say we're going to vote it. Here's our undervote, and that, that's accurate. But here's the one that we've determined that somebody tried to correct a mistake. So I can actually, on the screen, <coughs> remove the vote for Adams, and that will now be a good vote for Washington. And it will move from the overvoted category to a good vote for Washington. And you could go through and adjudicate the rest of the ballot if you need to. I happen to know this ballot is otherwise, otherwise good. And you can then save this. And here's the point. Can I jump in for just a second? Mm -hmm. So realize that you would find overvotes and marks like that from absentee ballots where the voter sent in their ballot and they're not actually in the precinct on election day. The, the clear cast machine, if somebody were to make that same mistake, it would stop them when they try to insert that ballot. It would kick it back out and it would say, you have an overvoted contest on the ballot. You can spoil the ballot, get a new one from the, the folks at the table or you could override it and push it through. It will count everything else on the ballot appropriately. It just won't count that overvote, right? So that's, that's important to realize, you know, when you look at our tabulation system, you're not going to be overwhelmed with huge, large numbers of overvotes because those will really be only isolated to your absentee ballots that are returned by mail. Can you program that to say how or what you want to kick back? Absolutely. So most folks do an, an overvote or they do a completely blank ballot, assuming the voter might have made a mistake if they bothered to come to the polling location and, uh, and, and didn't mark anything on the ballot. Yes, sir, do you have a question? How do you authenticate the amended ballot that's being amended? Mm -hmm. Karen? I'll let Karen answer the question. Yeah, I'm sorry, how, how do you authenticate? How is it recorded that it's been amended? Um, well, we do log every action that's done. It's done by uh, the user that logged in. Uh, certainly best practices we would recommend maybe a team of two do it together but then there's always a log that this was done okay and, yeah. and you only you're only that permission is only given to specific user roles so and so as a as an example i'll just go ahead and get my glasses back on the card resolutions here happens to be the one we just did okay so it's always logged and here's the user now i just have a generic user in here but that would be you know if a particular person logged in to do it you would know it and it's time and date stamped as well yes ma'am so if you're changing somebody's ballot what do you do print it out and then stick <coughs> it together or actually that's the beauty of our system in many of the legacy systems you would have to do something like that but we always retain that uh fact let me we always retain the uh exact image that the voter sent in so you can point to it and say this is why we changed this ballot. So it's only electronic. It's only right, right, then exactly. Then you have the paper ballot corrected. Right. Now you certainly still have that ballot and you, we just make it possible that you don't have to go find all of those. You know, you could always go get it if you needed to and actually there's a, a road map on our ballots. If you look at the top, this particular uh, um, number points to exactly where that ballot is. So if you needed to go find it, you could. 
does that tell you the precinct or the case number? Or? Depends on how you scanned it. There are a number of different options. It could be by precinct. Uh, it could be by, you know, you could have it separated by absentee. You know this is in your pile of absentee ballots, box number 13, ballot number 12. And then you would go to that box and you would find that ballot. And you probably only would want to adjudicate for overvotes on your absentees and you know with our system you're able to digitally sort out uh, from you know <coughs> all the ballots that have been tabulated just the absentees or just a specific batch if, uh, if that's what you're looking for. And some counties uh, don't change any adjudication at all right. unless they have a very very close contest. You know if you <coughs> want to if the margins are wide and you don't have attorneys looking for uh, you know votes that they can pick up to make a difference you certainly have the entire this is yeah. no different from what you had in a voting system before this just gives you the opportunity to identify it um, without having to go back and look for those ballots manually. Exactly. yeah and again it, it, it all goes back to putting the control back in your hands we're not telling you how to adjudicate these. We're not telling you what to do with them, if anything. What we are providing you is in a close contest when it's a three vote difference and you know at two o'clock in the morning on Tuesday night that you're gonna have you know, lawyers and candidates in your office. You wanna know that these things are out there because then it allows you to make decisions or at least show that you've, you know, you've got all the information available without having to pull every ballot and do a whole total hand count. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, you said that the machine itself takes up less room, but we're going to have to store paper and large sheets of paper, mm -hmm. anywhere from 60 to 100 pounds. So there's weight involved and size. And then you said the federal law requires you to keep it. How long do we have to keep it? I don't know. That varies from state yeah. to state, actually. Um, typically it's typically, right? 18 to 22 months. Um, we've also, we have some of our customers in Florida who have stopped um, archiving uh, their paper after a certain amount of time because their law, not Pennsylvania law, their law says that having the digital image is sufficient. Um, so that's really a Pennsylvania you know, question and answer rather than, um, you know, you can keep the ballots as long as you, you want. You have to. paper ballots now, to some degree, yes. Absentee, yes. Okay, so whatever retention law applies to those, it would be the same, I would think. Top of my head, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, I can find so a couple other things to look at on this screen, really quick, especially if we have some people that need to leave. Um, these are actually under votes, so a vote was not counted for George Washington here. If I click on that and look at the whole ballot, I can see why. Um, somebody circled a candidate's name here and did not fill in the oval and didn't even really touch the oval. So we have an undervote for Washington. I, I would argue that it could be a, a real vote for Washington. And would, again, Bill made a perfect point here. It's not my decision, it's not our decision, but we show you this is there. Uh, the reason I, I wanted to show you this example specifically is I talked about the colors over here earlier. So if you remember what I was saying, this lavender or purple or whatever you want to call it is an undervote. But green is actually a good vote for somebody. And the reason these were counted as good votes is this person's circles actually went through the ovals and it counted votes for them. And, and they're probably good votes. I mean, they meant to vote for these folks. They circled their names. But they didn't hit the oval here. So imagine this particular race might have, you know, a one or a two vote difference You'll want to know these are out there, and our system will show it to you. We, we essentially database every extraneous mark on the ballot and, and show it to you. One last example on this particular page. Uh, these are votes that were counted for other people at the bottom. So as I'm hovering over this, but we have flagged them because we think you might want to look at them. So in this particular case, a vote was counted for John Adams, but I don't know how you know, maybe the people in the front row, but I don't, I don't know if everybody else can see, there seems to be a little dot in George Washington's oval. If we look at that whole ballot, you know, it looks like maybe somebody rested their pen there. 
Now notice the color on this on the side. There is a vote for John Adams. And I would argue that this vote has been counted accurately like it should. Maybe somebody just rested their pen, maybe they dropped their pen or something like that. Once again, though, our system sees this and says, hey, take a look at this and make sure that this is counted properly. No other system is going to show you things like this. Uh, I wouldn't do anything with this ballot, and I doubt you would either, but at least we show it to you to make sure. If we go back to our dashboard real quick, I'll show you a couple of other things. Our scanners, and uh, we actually have a video of, of our, one of our main scanners that scans anywhere from four to 7,000 ballots an hour, and that depends on the length of your ballot. Um, and when we give those throughput numbers, those are actual throughput numbers, meaning our scanners don't stop because it finds something weird. A lot of the competition scanners will stop the whole process if it runs, to, runs into particular issues. And here's a good example of that. So here are four cards that our, our software has said, hey, we have an image here, but we can't tell what it is. We can't uh, parse out the votes. Well, let's look at why. I'll just click on the link and pretty obvious why. It looks like this ballot was torn. Uh, the coding channel is gone. It can't tell anything about this ballot. But much like the uh, adjudication of that overvo overvote, we can actually adjudicate this ballot and give the votes to the people uh, that deserve them. So I'll click vote there and we can go through and adjudicate this ballot. I'm not going to take the time to go through this whole thing. It's the same process I've already shown you. But the point I want to make here, and, and for the record, I've sat on your side of the desk. I've been a director of elections in Ohio for several years and, and done other jobs within a board of elections office. The thing I like about this is we don't put any technology between the voter's pen and your eyes. So there's no remaking of a ballot that would be your interpretation of that voter's marks. We actually show you exactly what the voter submitted and allow you to work from that. And you can always then go back and review that. And again, it's the same piece of paper the voter sent in uh, to you guys. So does that kind of make sense? <clears throat> One last example, and I'll turn the floor back over to Bill or, or Ingrid. Um, we've got situations like this that once again, we process what the voter sent in. This is what we would call a federal right in absentee ballot. It would be legal in any jurisdiction in the country uh, with the proper paperwork and the proper circumstances. We could actually scan this in and adjudicate a ballot such as this that was legally submitted. And once again, we don't have to get out an extra ballot and remake it. We actually work from the exact document the voter sent in to give those votes where they're legally able to be applied. So that's the kind of flexibility that our count system gives you and, and the way that we process paper that, that I think we all believe is different than anyone else does. What about write-in? Write-in votes. Great question. Mm -hmm. Let's show you some write-ins. Okay, so here I happen to preset this up. Um, and you'll have to excuse me, I gave this demonstration a lot in Ohio, so I have Woody, Woody Hayes as one of my uh, my you can eat now. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. I should have thought more about this. Um, so here are actually images. As you saw from our software, we don't just look at the oval. We look at the whole race box. We look at the whole candidate uh, space. So you'll see that uh, we have filled in ovals with write-in names. If I scroll down, we have people that didn't fill in the ovals. So we separate those for you because I know that legally you guys cannot count those if the oval's not filled in. So we'll put those in a different spot so you can see them, but no danger of counting them. So as I go through this, I can open up this little box here and I can add a candidate's name. And just to be quick, I'll add W. Hayes. Add that candidate and then I can just start adjudicating votes for Woody. And I'll just do a handful of them here. Then if I open this box back, I see that I've, oops, why'd you let me do that, Bill? I can't see the full screen. Did you know that aside? <laughs> yeah. Dump the box. All right, I'm just gonna move down and start over. 
So I can adjudicate votes for Woody Hayes. And then when I go back, I can click on those votes. I've done eight of them and proof them, make sure I haven't made any errors. And assuming I'm good, I go back and those are actually all gone. And I've, I've worked with those, I can now move on. Um, you know, if we have this as unassigned, but maybe I want to add a scattered, and I can adjudic adjudicate for scattered. So maybe I want to put my none of the aboves in there, my Mickey Mouses in there. And same deal applies. Once I do as many as I want to do, I can go proof them, come back, and then when I go back, those are out of my way. Does that mean that they've been counted? Or well, are they just yeah, out somewhere? It nice? means that they've been dealt with and they're out of your way. Okay. And then what you ultimately get to is you can export your adjudications. It's warning me because I haven't gone through all of them. Mm -hmm. So I'll just bypass that. Ultimately, you end up with a CSV file that you can open in Excel <coughs> that has your totals by precinct. You even have a link back to that ballot if you want to take a look at it, you can. And so you're provided with a comprehensive report by precinct of every ballot you adjudicated. So you have all your scatters or whatever. <coughs> and my understanding is in Pennsylvania, you might have to count a lot of random write-in votes, right, for single candidates or, or whatever. And so any candidate you enter, then you can have access to that on the report and see them. Um, but does that add it to the account, let's say, it, 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 it doesn't import directly into clear count. Uh, it's an external utility at this point. We're working at integrating this functionality into clear count, but that's that's what we're shooting for. For does clear count show number of write-in votes at least? Yeah. Yes. Oh, it does. Yeah. yeah. So then you can say you 15 write-in votes, votes, and then you could have that. You can actually then. go to the write-in area of a contest, and you can hand count those from there if you know if you weren't using this tool but uh, but this automatically generates the report which most people have to do manually which is a pain but okay so, so here are some I have zeros in most of these but here are some write in totals just because you know if I didn't vote for any when I did this demonstration but here's where your totals would be and they appear in reports too. So when we do like a uh, PDF report, a lot of options here that you can select for a, a paper-based report or, or if you want to generate it in an XML, we can do that as well. So there's two things, uh, not, not to go into futures too deeply, but uh, the roadmap for the write-in tool is, is step one, we're integrating it into clear count. Step two, we're exploring uh, character recognition technology to see to what level we can automatically generate, you know, uh, uh, buck or, or, you know, put in buckets uh, specific certified candidates. Um, for places that have For places that have certified <laughs> candidates, I'm <obviously. laughs> Yeah. And Kira, you, talk, you touched on that a little bit. We do have the ability to export our reports in a, in a printable form, a PDF form, of course, um, but also in an XML format so that it could be uh, given to your IT department. If you have a, an election night reporting uh, module that you want to populate and have on the county oh, website. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, we could do the same format, a CSV file for the state's upload. Those were the main things I wanted to get across, and I, I appreciate y'all's patience, and I apologize again for being late. Um, if there's anything that we didn't cover that, that you are interested in, in asking about or talking about, we'd love to hear your feedback. Um, any thoughts? And we can stay and play with the equipment a little bit yeah, if you'd like to. Yeah, as long as you want. A couple things I want to see or ask, but I'm going to wait sure. for everybody to.
Thank you. Thanks for having us. Good stuff. Thanks.